Line with us is uh, Alexander, Alex Zajcik. Uh, Alex is a freelance journalist uh, focusing on politics, media, and the environment, a contributor to the, both The Nation and Jacobin, uh, author of the new book, Owning the Sun, A People's History of Monopoly Medicine from Aspirin to COVID-19. Uh, the website is Zajcik, Z-A-I-T-C-H-I-K dot com. And uh, Alex, welcome back to the program. It's been a while since we've talked. Tell us about this book. It has. Uh, well, it was sort of a pandemic project. Um, I've been writing about prescription drugs and drug pricing politics for a few years, but when the pandemic struck, it was clear that that same set of issues was about to return in the context of a global public health crisis. And the last time we saw a stress test uh, of the global intellectual property regime as it applies to medicines. We had um, a rather disastrous situation um, that came to a head in Africa, which some of uh, your listeners may remember, where uh, the pharmaceutical companies were basically suing the Mandela government not to produce or import um, low-cost antiretrovirals to address the, the HIV AIDS crisis. And it was clear that unless something changed with the current system, um, that was going to be reproduced in the context of therapeutics and vaccines for COVID-19. And in fact, this is what we've seen play out, which, which you've talked about quite a bit. Um, so I wanted to sort of track that in real time, but also tell the story of how we got to a place where this could be allowed to happen and considered okay and normal uh, as the sort of legal regime that we've come to accept as just the way it is. So how did we get here? How did we end up, I, I know after World War II, there was a massive effort to pour uh, research money into uh, particularly infectious disease kind of drugs, you know, and a, a whole new classes of antibiotics were coming out. Um, but, uh, you know, and we have famously this enormous amount of federal funding for the development of drugs, vaccines, uh, even medical devices that comes out of the National Institutes of Health. How did it all just get turned into a giant profit mill for a small handful of companies? Well, as you know, it, it is basically a post-war story, a post-World War II story. But before that, we have a much longer history in which uh, medicines were considered an exception to the monopoly carve-out that is the patent, that is the um, invention patent, which is the one way you can have a monopoly in our society. But legally. within that exception, exactly, legally. But within that, there was an ethical taboo against medical monopoly that withstood the test of time well into the 20th century. And it was only during that explosion of federal research money, which you just referenced, that the companies basically said, well, we've had enough about that. And we're going to throw off this ethical stricture that has previously sort of bound us to higher um, goals than market share and uh, stock price. And you have a very intense effort to basically change uh, not only norms, uh, but also laws that gave them access to publicly financed research. And they have been very successful at both gaining access to that research on a monopoly basis and also protecting and expanding that access, which is a story that continues very much into the present day. So uh, two, two thoughts come to mind. One is, uh, how do we structurally change this? How do, how do we go back you know, and reverse some of this? But also, specifically to the, to the issue of COVID, um, uh, you know, we've had uh, Lori Wallach on a number of times on the show from uh, uh, Trade Watch, Global Trade Watch, you know, Public Citizens uh, Project, uh, promoting the idea that we should have these so-called TRIPS waivers um, the internet, intellectual properties that, that govern vaccines, um, that the companies that develop these vaccines, and, and of course the Moderna one was paid for in large part by you and me with our tax dollars, that these companies should be uh, allowing manufacturers in third world countries who have the ability to manufacture vaccines but can't do it legally because of the patents, to allow them to manufacture these drugs and pay, a, uh, instead of a huge royalty to these big companies, just a very small royalty, or in some cases, no royalty, I suppose, depending on the country. But uh, as far as I recall, all of the proposals involved some small royalty. These companies would not be harmed by this. Um, so anyhow, the, two, two questions to toss to you there, Alex. Right, right. Well, the first part, what do we need to do? In very broad terms, what we need to do is relink innovation and research to actual public health needs and link reward to uh, breakthroughs that help 
<laughs> the largest number of people as opposed to simply monopoly ownership of uh, patents and the ability to jack up price without any government countervailing force whatsoever. Right now, the system incentivizes monopoly. It does not incentivize um, expensive research geared towards uh, making people healthier and lives longer. It's, it's a fundamentally broken system. And, and the result that we get is exactly what um, you would expect based on the incentive structure that we have. Um, with regard to TRIPS, you're absolutely right. Uh, suspending TRIPS, um, putting the uh, vaccine and therapeutic train on different rails during the pandemic would not bankrupt anybody. In fact, there's a long history of uh, public-private collaboration uh, during crises. For example, penicillin project during World War II, the government was in the driver's seat. The government huge contracts to industry two, three times the cost of production, cost plus contracts, they did very well. In fact, the industry we know today is in many ways uh, a, an outgrowth of those contracts. The huge amounts of tech transfer were provided, but they did not have a monopoly in penicillin. So what you had after the war was a competitive market. You had a bunch of companies producing this stuff. They were all making money. They just weren't minting billionaires during a global pandemic, which is what you had in the last two years, which by any standards of civilization, should be unacceptable when you have vaccine uh, factories sitting idle. Yeah, yeah, you would think. So where are we at in terms of progress on this? Are there, are there champions in Congress, for example? Well, actually, even a larger question, to, to what extent is the United States an outlier in this? And then where are we at in terms of making these changes? Unfortunately, the United States is not an outlier anymore. It was up into the post-war period, but it has since, especially around the time of the World Trade Organization, 1980s, and eventually with the signing of, of um, the accord in 1995, has brought on the Europeans, brought on Japan, brought on Canada. A lot of these countries were very reluctant to completely abandon what used to be the ethical taboo around medical monopoly and globalize the US system. But they've since uh, come around uh, to the program and the, are now the, fully the on board. The triumph of fact, neoliberalism. Yeah, and in fact, at the WTO, it was the Europeans who were actually behind, at least on paper, the White House position of, of backing some sort of broad waiver of uh, COVID-19 IP. Is that, is that are, are you speaking to, you know, the German resistance to the TRIPS waivers with regard to the- The Germans Congress? led it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, th this has uh, been substantial. How about in the United States Congress? Is uh, if, if we put this in the frame of you know, the rise of neoliberalism in the United States. In fact, let me put this in this frame, and you can tell me if this is a crazy analogy or not. Um, you know, in the, in the 1960s, you started seeing Milton Friedman and, and uh, you know, some of his buddies, the Mont Pelerin Society and this whole thing that came out of that, but also people like Robert Bork, who, who was actually far more influential than most people realize. Um, he's the reason why our monopoly laws were changed as radically as they were in 1983, and why yep. the Supreme Court changed their tune on, on general monopoly laws. Um, but, you know, these guys were promoting this neoliberal idea that government is always a bad force and, you know, unless it's running a military, a court or a police department and yeah. and that uh, everything should be left up to the so-called free market and the you know so-called free billionaires who own that marketplace. And and that kind of got us to here. Well, now we're seeing I, I would say Joe Biden has been the first Democratic president since Lyndon Johnson who has not adopted a neoliberal position. I mean, Jimmy Carter really started this in 79 with deregulating the airline and trucking industries and whatnot. Is it possible that as neoliberalism is ex increasingly exposed as the fraud that it is, I mean, the, you know, the, the, the neoliberalism that was imposed on, on the former Soviet Union, for example, is what brought us Putin, you know, in 1999. Um, is it possible that as that gets exposed that we're going to see this change in the United States? Is there a movement to change this happening in the United States Congress? There is there are signs of progress, which is a hopeful thing um, amid the otherwise depressing uh, situation that we've seen during the pandemic. Uh, Lloyd Doggett, there's a bunch of people uh, obviously led by the Progressive Caucus, but what used to be limited to um, progressive Democrats is now bleeding into the mainstream of the party, which is very heartening. Um, and you know the details of that are kind of bottled up right now with Build Back Better, but there is a, a tussle within the party to get stronger and um, more meaningful reform of, of the industry. Uh, 
and they realize that the stakes of not doing so are quite large. One very important point that can't be stressed enough, Tom, is that there is no free market in pharmaceuticals. Despite the industry, what it says, it's all based on government protected packet patents, right. which are extended beyond the term of what the Constitution should allow. Amen. Amen. Al Alexander Zychek, the book is A People's History of Monopoly Medicine from Aspirin to COVID-19. Owning the Sun is the title. Alex, thanks a lot for dropping by. Thank you, Tom.